For Pacifica Radio, December 29th, 2013, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. All right, y'all, welcome to the show. It is Anti-War Radio, here every Sunday morning from 8.30 to 9 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. I'm your host, Scott Horton, and my website is scotthorton.org. You can find all my interview archives there, as well as my blog and my link to my Facebook page and all that stuff, scotthorton.org. More than 3,000 interviews now, going back to 2003. Our guest today is Adam Morrow, reporter for Interpress Service. That's IPSnews.net, and he lives in Cairo, Egypt. Welcome back to the show, Adam. How are you doing? Good, Scott. Thanks. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I really appreciate you joining us. And uh, sure. so here we My are. Pleasure. It's almost uh, three years since the Arab Spring broke out in Tunisia and then in Egypt and the overthrow of the military dictatorship there. Uh, and yet here we are about uh, six months out from the cancellation of that revolution uh, or the beginnings of the restoration of democracy, depending on whether right. you want to go along with what the U.S. Secretary of State claims or not. Um, and it looks like the people who, the group, the Muslim Brotherhood that won out in the revolution and then lost out last summer, uh, they now have gone from being declared uh, outlawed to being declared a terrorist group. And the mass roundups have begun. Can you give us the latest details? Sure, sure. Well, the last couple of days, there's definitely been a transformation in terms of the demonstrations, in terms of the protest, the pro morsi protest activity that's been going on. Um, like you said, it's been almost six months now since the July 3rd the military coup, uh, which saw the democratically elected president Mohamed Morsi being ousted by uh, by the uh, by the military, uh, and uh, just over the course of the last couple of days, as, as we've said in the past, you know we've we've been watching these daily demonstrations, daily protests in Cairo and all of the all of the uh, all of the provinces. Uh, just but just over the course of the last day, from yesterday in particular, uh, there's sort of been they seem to have stepped up uh, their activity a little bit, and we're seeing a much harder, almost intifada like activity now where we're seeing uh several uh several police vehicles are, are are generally burnt every day we're seeing regular casualties at least one or two unfortunately one or two or three or i think yesterday was four four or five or six uh fatalities these are protesters that are that are being killed <clears throat> by either uh bird shot being fired uh in shotguns or uh, by live fire by you know by hard uh, ammunition and uh, and the uh, the a lot of the activity seems to have sort of come to a head on university campuses, uh, especially the El Azhar University campus in uh, in Cairo, which is also famous for being it's it's, uh, it's a big uh, religious establishment, a big major seat of learning for Sunni in, in you know in the Sunni Muslim world, mm -hmm. and that seems to have become an epicenter of protest activity. But as well as several other campuses and universities around the uh, around the country, uh, including in Upper Egypt and in, in Alexandria, in uh, several several in Cairo. But El Azhar seems to be the focal point of it right now, and there are actually running battles going on as we speak. I think one uh, one protester was killed early this morning, and it just seems like the harder the authorities come down on uh, on the pro on the protest activity, uh, the just the the, the, the greater uh, you know it just it, it as usual as we've seen so many times in the past, it just sort of elicits the opposite you know the the exact opposite of what they want, and instead of cowing people and, and keeping people off the streets and frightening frightening them into their homes, you know with threats of five-year jail sentences or even life in prison or even execution for now for belonging to a so-called terrorist organization it's had actually just the opposite effect and you're seeing you're seeing protests protests getting larger you're seeing the protest base expanding as well the uh, the the pro army media here is trying desperately to portray all of the protest activity as purely muslim brotherhood that these are just muslim brotherhood members that all of these you know that these 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 demonstrations are 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 entirely peaceful by Muslim hardcore Muslim Brotherhood members, and everybody else is sort of you know everybody else is sort of abandoned them. When that's not the case, um, you actually see broad grassroots you know opposition to uh, to the uh, to the military coup. 
Um, uh, so you're seeing, you know, thousands of people, in some cases, tens of thousands of people. I heard uh, even the CNN reported, apparently, that something like 22 different major marches uh, uh, were, uh, were recorded in Cairo yesterday. Protest marches were recorded in yesterday. And that, you know, you've also had, um, you know, there have been several recent catalysts as well for this. You've had the, the Muslim Brotherhood being listed as a terrorist organization, which is... You know, even critics of the Brotherhood here, even even their harsh, some of their harshest critics here, are saying that this was just a, that was a ridiculous move because they've never, you know, you can't you can't sort of claim that without a without a, an investigation or some kind of judicial, you know, in, inquiry or, you know, they just said it uh, off the cuff uh, after in the wake of if you remember, I think it was Thursday there was a, or Wednesday there was a bombing. In the, in the Nile Delta, there was a major bombing in the Nile Delta, a car bombing in which uh, at least 11 police officers were killed and a handful of other people were killed as well. And, uh, and another group claimed responsibility for that. Another, another, you know, this a shadowy Sinai-based militant group called uh, Ansar Beit al-Maktas uh, claimed responsibility for that. Uh, so, uh, but that didn't stop the government from listing, you know, from suddenly declaring, abruptly declaring the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization. And that actually brought people out on the street even more. Well, there's plenty of places to follow up there. First of all, it sounds like, I guess, maybe just with the advent of satellite TV and that kind of thing, access to outside sources, the the military's friends in the media are not able to get away with, as as they may have been able to get away with in the past. Um, That's a really good point. Some That's of a really these good things. Point. And people have, the anti-brotherhood rhetoric in the media at this point, and again, I have to stress that it's the state media as well as the uh, as well as the privately owned media, which is unanimously owned by good friends of the of the Mubarak regime. The, the anti-brotherhood uh, rhetoric that we're hearing that has, has has gotten so out of control, has has gotten so has lost so you know basis in fact so extraordinarily. But uh, I, I think at this point, I mean, vast swaths of the public who might have bought into it earlier are now really starting to see are starting to see through it now, mm-hmm. uh, and it's having less and less effect. And the, and the the, the, the you know these this new these new military backed rulers really they never imagined the degree of opposition they were going to get to this move to this to, to ousting Morsi. They never they thought they were going to you know they they thought there were going to be protests. Uh, you know it was predicted oh we'll see you know scattered protests for about a month and then everything's just going to go back to normal. And that has been completely put to the lie at this mm-hmm. point. And I I think they're really really stuck now. They really don't know what to do because they're getting plenty uh, lots of opposition from abroad as well. Other countries are very reticent. About about recognizing the new government because because it was the result of an unconstitutional you know military ouster, so they've got problems abroad. They're constantly sending out these teams, dispatching people to explain what's happening in Egypt. That's the, the mantra they keep repeat, repeating. Oh well, the foreigners don't understand the situation in Egypt, so we have to explain it to them, and that's just falling on deaf ears because what's you know because the. Uh, you know what they're doing right now coming the the crackdowns we've even mainstream human rights organizations which traditionally i've noticed don't like to say good things about islamists i've noticed uh are are coming out very strongly against uh, what's happening including human rights watch and other ones are coming out and saying you know uh, saying the, uh, for example, the uh, the uh, charges that are being leveled against morsi uh, who remains in detention at an undisclosed uh, uh, location right now, until now, six months later, the charges that are being brought against him, I, the Human Rights Watch described them as insane. Uh, so they're just not, uh, things Things aren't going well for them. And I think they probably, at this point, they're, in, they're at the point where now they wish they hadn't done it. <laughs> but they can't, they, they sort of can't get out of it at this point. And they've become also, another thing is they've gotten all of their moderate elements have left, like Baradai, Baradai was the big one. Mohammed Baradai was the big, the, you know, uh, was, was the big liberal pillar of their sort of coalition. The former and director of the IAEA. A former director of the IAEA, widely considered a, you know, a liberal voice for moderation and that sort of thing. And he bailed very early on after the big massacre in August. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just, and they, and, and was, as a result of that, because he left, was condemned by the pro-army media, and they, they, there were even people who raised cases against him for uh, that he committed uh, treason, that he committed uh, that this was treason, leaving the government like this at, a, at, a, at such a sensitive time. So I think people in the government, you know, they wish they hadn't sort of embarked on this venture, but they know that they can't leave at this point because they'll suffer the same fate, but they will, and they'll they'll be accused by their own. You know, you've got this situation, you know, where you've got when you've got situations like this where they, it starts to the movement starts to devour its own. 
mm-hmm. you know you've got you've sort of got that sort of thing going on and it just it just may, it ends up making it making them more hard more and more extreme falling deeper and deeper and deeper into their own extremism and now they're just they're stuck you know because they've rejected they've rejected a political solution especially you know especially by naming the brotherhood a uh, a uh, a terrorist organization the april 6th movement actually came out and said this they said by doing this you're you're effectively ending any possibility of, you know, a political solution, a negotiated solution to what's going on right now. You know, and they, they basically, that was the final nail in the coffin of, of any kind of, you know, political uh, resolution to this. Mm-hmm. The you April 6th movement being the young and liberal, the, the ones that the Americans preferred. Yeah, well, they were the ones who uh, spearheaded the January twenty fifth, the January twenty fifth revolution in two thousand eleven. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting now is, even though those guys, April sixth in particular, even those guys supported the June thirtieth demonstrations against Morsi, they have now come out and said, "Look, this was a military coup." And in fact, three big liberal uh, liberal activists. I'm sure you know this. This was pretty widely covered abroad. Three big liberal activists, including the the, the main guy in April sixth, uh, have been now have all been sentenced to jail. They are all in prison for three years now. Um, for participating in unlicensed protest. Um, so it's come full circle. The January 25th thing has come full circle when after January 25th you had a, a, the Egyptians celebrating their newfound freedom and their ability to, to, you know, to go on the streets and express themselves whenever they wanted to and you know, voice dissent in any way they wanted to. You've, you've gone from that to, to basically this hardcore fascist dictatorship where you know, public gatherings have become outlawed and da-da-da-da. But, uh, but fortunately the people aren't accepting it. Vast swaths of the public aren't aren't going to let it pass. They're not sitting down. They're not going to stand for it. And uh, they continue to hit the streets. It's, it is, like I said, it is mostly Islamist. It is definitely driven by the Islamist current. But, uh, but the popular support against the, uh, the military coup is definitely growing with the, with the, with the blunders that the, uh, the, these, these, these blunders that the, that the coup authorities uh, keep committing every day. Like another big thing, just, uh, just uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you if you have a question, but just before that, uh, uh, one of the things they did just two or three days ago was they, they basically froze the funds of something like more than a thousand Islamist, uh, you know, Islamist uh, leaning charity organizations. But really, they're really, these are apolitical organizations, but they do provide charity for something like, uh, the numbers I'm hearing is something like three million Egyptian families depend on these, on these charitable organizations, these Islamist charitable organizations. So they clo- when they close them down, basically, uh, they cut off uh, millions and millions of people off from you know badly needed uh, humanitarian supply. You know, like these these people. Yeah, Ramsey Baroud just Ramsey Baroud wrote a thing like that just the other day. In fact, um, I think it's on the blog at antiwar dot com about uh, how the Muslim Brotherhood itself is a gigantic charitable organization and yeah. and sort of fulfills like Hezbollah in a sense, sort of fulfills the role of um, the social services state at the very lowest level. Uh, providing Definitely. education, food, clothing to those in the most dire need. And you Definitely. call them all a terrorist yeah. organization, you're leaving a lot of innocent people in the lurch and with no exactly. notice at all. M- literally millions of people, and it seems, I, I mean, I just can't think of a stupider move. It sort of betrays the desperation. It betrays the desperation of the coup authorities that they would take such a step. I mean, people are saying they, they took the state, they're freezing the funds because they want to seize the funds because they're that broke that they need to get their hands on money, uh, which if, if that's true, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just unbelievable if it's really reached that extent that they're, that they're so desperate. Well, they're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to, um, they're trying to get support, uh, you know, just weeks before this highly contested, extremely controversial um, contra, um, constitutional referendum that's coming up in just two, two or three weeks, mm-hmm. uh, and to alienate literally alienate millions of, re- of, of uh, registered voters by cutting off supp- you know, supplies of the most needy port se- segments of society uh, just seems... Um, they, they actually realized, they realized what they did, and actually one of the major, uh, one, of the ma- one of these major charities, uh, they actually reversed the decision and said, no, 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 we're not going to freeze their funds because they, you know, they sort of woke yeah. up and realized just what the implications were. What's incredible is one of the big charges against Morsi, one of the big accusations against Morsi, and you know one of the one of the excuses for hitting the streets on June 30th and demanding early, you know, snap presidential elections, or that he eventually, you know, eventually, or that he stepped down, which is what it eventually turned into, was uh, was because one of the accusations against him was that he was driving the country towards uh, civil war, that the you know that this uh, this ichwanization or this brotherhoodization of the state and his you know his uh, his heavy-handed policies were driving the uh, were driving the country. Towards 
towards civil war. And all of that was hyperbole. All of that was exaggeration. A lot of that, you know, a lot of these charges against uh, his, you know, claims of his that he was that he was di- dictatorial and all of that have turned out in retrospect, have turned out to have been vastly, vastly overplayed. But one of the one of the reasons, one of the biggest uh, charges against him was what, that he was driving the country towards civil war and that, uh, you know, we have to stop, you know, we have to stop this inevitable march to this, this rising polarization. We have to stop it in order to uh, in order to stop this, you know, the, this Algeria scenario that everybody was warning about. And then it turns out that the, that the coup authorities in the last six months, I mean, everything that they've done, I mean, I can't imagine a better way to drive the country towards civil war, which is exactly what they were charging Morsi with doing. I mean, every step they seem to take is basically designed to turn this, the conflict, this, this long-standing historical conflict between the state, the Egyptian state, and the, and the Islamist opposition, to change it from a political equilibrium, to change it from a political struggle into, a, uh, into an existential struggle. That's what we've seen over the course of the last six months. And, and again, the, the designation, the terrorism designation on the Muslim Brotherhood that we just saw in the last couple of days was definitely the final step towards that. You know, this is like, this has become existential now. It's like there's only room, you know, for one of us you know, in this country. Right. Um, and that's scary. That's well, and scary. as you're saying, too, it's driving more and more people who were never members to becoming supporters and or members and, and then maybe worse, right? I mean, the... I was thinking, actually, that, you know, people were afraid, people were talking after Morsi's ouster, people were saying this is the end of the Muslim Brotherhood. We're, what we're witnessing now is the end of political Islam in, in Egypt and possibly the region because of things that were going on elsewhere in Tunisia and stuff like that. But I, I've actually thought that, uh, I, I've actually been thinking recently, the way things are going now in the big, in, in the big picture, in the, sort of the grand scheme of things, as crazy and messed up as everything is right now, in the grand scheme of things, I think, I think they're going to end up coming out of this whole thing stronger than ever. I think the Brotherhood is going to end up coming out of this thing stronger than ever because they end up, they, they look like such the victims, you know? They've, they've, you know, they've been such the victims in all of this. They've sustained far heavier casualties than at any other other, you know, political, uh, you know, political camp, you know, the revolutionaries and the so-called liberals and that sort of thing never faced down barrages of live fire, like, uh, you know, heavy, you know, heavy ammunition, right. which is what's going on now. Well, the, the, and they've you know, proven, the, the, the people of Egypt proved three years ago that if they all agree and put their mind to it, that they can overthrow a military dictatorship that... If it's, exactly. You know, exactly. enough, of, they have that enough different factions combined anyway, and the junior officers will not go to war against them. Exactly. They have that precedent that they got in, on January 25th, 2011, and they know that it can be done. So it's sort of like, I sort of see it as like, Jan- on January 25th, the genie got out of the bottle. You know, that the state has been trying to suppress for so many decades. The, it, you know, the, the court popped. The genie got out of the bottle, and now what you have now is the last six months is you now have them trying desperately to get it back inside the bottle, and yeah. they can't. All they right. just they can't. Hey, it's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Adam Morrow. He's a reporter for Interpress Service at IPSnews.net, living in Cairo, and we're talking about the Arab Spring turned winter and what it all means here. Um, and now, so let me ask you this, because... The, the so-called liberals, and who knows exactly what all that means, but uh, the April 6th movement and, and their friends, uh, for them to decide last summer that they would prefer to join up with the military dictatorship against the Muslim Brotherhood, they must have had some real grievances against the Muslim Brotherhood other than just, well, we wish we had won the elections instead of you. Um, yeah, sure, sure. But I mean, that's like saying, I mean, the Republicans have serious grievances with Obama as well, but they don't, they don't. Well, but see, I wouldn't say that. Them. I would say they have trivial grievances with him. And we live in a one party state here where the, the it's mostly a dime's worth of difference kind of thing. But you that's don't true. see, for example, you know, Democrats or Republicans, uh, except on the very most fringe World Net Daily margins, saying that we want the military to oust this guy for us, never mind the next election. You just don't see that. Uh, So Mm. what is it about the Muslim Brotherhood? I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want them to be my elected government or unelected government either. Um, There's a lot of people in Egypt who put a lot on the line to really reverse their own revolution. Go ahead and invite the military back in to just save us from these guys. So... They must be pretty bad in some ways, right, Adam? What are we missing here? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, a part of it, a, a large part of it can be chalked up to political inexperience. You know, um, they had just come out of the January 25th experience and they sort of figured, you know, they were there's, a, there's an element of impatience as well. You know, why let this guy complete another three years, you know, when we can just do what we did on January 25th and we can hit a reset button and we can make it all go and we can have fresh elections and everything like that. And that's just political inexperience. And that's not, you know, that's breaking the rules of the game. And once you break the rules of the game, you're back in the jungle. And that's the mistake they made. They should have stayed on the Democratic path. And if they had beef with such incredible, you know, such, uh, such, uh, if they had these grievances, and it's, it's not like Morsi committed any crimes, it's not like any of the Brotherhood people committed any crimes, all of the grievances were of a political nature. So what they should have done is instead of joining forces with, with the, you know, the same forces that had controlled the country for the last 30 plus years, instead of throwing in their lot with them and taking their chances of seeing exactly what's happened, happen. Instead of taking that chance, why didn't they organize? Why didn't they get their acts together? Why didn't they, uh, you know, why weren't they able to form uh, respectable, uh, you know, uh, political parties with, uh, you know, with uh, intelligent uh, political platforms and, uh, you know, and go out to the public and campaign and campaign and try to build uh, support. And uh, when, when Morsi was ousted, they could have just waited another six or eight uh, months for, and they, had, they would have had fresh uh, parliamentary elections. And if everybody was so angry with Morsi, then why not punish them at the ballot box? I mean, isn't that what, isn't that what sort of mature nations do, you know, democratic nations do? That's how they get back at their political opponents if they aren't happy. That's how the people express their dissent. They, they punish them at the ballot boxes. And they had that opportunity. They could have done that. But instead, they were impatient. Instead, they were impatient. Some of them were impatient. And I think some of them actually, some of these so-called liberal forces were actually, are actually secretly in, aligned with, uh, with the establishment, with the pre-January 25th establishment. I think there was a lot of that going on. I think there were a lot of people who had, long, who had traditionally called themselves liberals and posited themselves as opponents of the regime and critics of the regime. But at the end of the day, when push came to shove, they, they ended up showing their hands and showing that they were actually, they're not liberals and they were actually, at the end of the day, they're actually a last line of defense. For well, the, now, for the in the short term, it's mm-hmm. working out for them, though, right? Because they're having this uh, referendum in... Uh, and what's the referendum about, exactly? This isn't parliamentary. The referendum... Elections. Okay, the referendum is on uh, an amended version of Morsi's uh, constitution. Morsi's constitution passed with a 64% margin. Uh, it was accepted in, a, in, uh, in elections that were widely regarded to have been fair uh, uh, late last year. It passed with 64%. Um, what they did is they took it, I think they made 20 or so amendments to it, and now they're going to put it before another public referendum on January, in, the mid- in mid-January. Mm. Um, and this referendum is widely seen as a test of their... You know, it's widely seen as a as a referendum on them. It's widely seen as a referendum on the on the coup or the revolution, however you want to see it. Just as the uh, just as the last year's referendum, I'd like to add, was widely seen as a as a referendum on Morsi's performance. And it's no mean feat that despite the incredible, incredible media campaign against the Constitution last year, they still managed to get a sixty four percent margin, which I think is I think is relevant. I think that shows that Morsi still by the by late last year, he still had enough popularity to command a, a, a significant win uh, at the ballot box, uh, which is important. So anyway, you've got the you've got the, this new amended version of the Constitution is coming up for a vote in, in two weeks. And the pro Morsi camp is saying boycott Huge, huge segments of the population are saying boycott. I don't think they'll be able to. Mu- a lot of people are expecting it to be uh, to be rigged. A lot of people are saying that they're going to rig it. Yeah. Um, they're desperate. They're desperate to get a large turnout, um, and they're desperate to get a yes vote. And what's interesting is nobody's ever said they've never said the government here has never said what would happen if it gets voted down. You know, which makes people suspicious. It's just like. They're just assuming that it's going to be it's going to be approved that the constitution the, the amended version of the constitution is going to be approved, mm-hmm. and that has raised eyebrows because people are like, well, I mean, well, I mean, if the military's like- plan is to just put whatever pliable Democrat leaning types, you know, as their front men, because Mubarak he was kind of ugly, right? Uh, so maybe you want to mm-hmm. maybe you want to do something like and that to keep military your military background. dictatorship. If they just exclude the right from now on, I mean, the populist right out there, that's not going to work. That's going to just end up, I mean, it seems like the current violence is going to just keep spreading. And then, of course, for for every violent attack is a further crackdown and back and forth it goes, as it's supposed to. Yeah. 
I mean, right? Is that what people think in Cairo, that this could lead to a civil war? Um, more and more people have been saying that. Uh, like <clears throat> like I said earlier, this, Al- this Algeria scenario, more and more people are sort of talking about that now. Um, at the same time, people have traditionally, when I've spoken to, to a lot of Egyptians in the past about this, there's a general consensus that Egyptian culture and Egyptian society isn't just simply isn't as prone to violence as the sort of more rugged Algerian people. I don't, you know, I don't know if I, I'm not an Algeria expert. I've never been to Algeria, and I don't want to make vast, gen, you know, broad generalizations like that that I that I can't confirm myself. But that is sort of the sense that I've gotten in in Egypt. And what is remarkable is that with everything that's happened over the lo- the course of the last six months, um, with all of the with the with the death of of if you remember the massacre in August. I mean, that was in mid-August, August 14th. You had two big uh, pro-Morsi sit-ins that were violently dispersed by the Egyptian security forces uh, and led to the the death toll is widely disputed. But you have reputable human rights uh, organizations that that are saying at least... Well, deep into the hundreds, 800, 900, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it was like Tiananmen Square, only... Yeah. Our military, yeah. our pet military doing it, and so it wasn't a big scandal in the U.S. the way that was. Well, I, I think, it, I believe it was Human Rights, rights Watch that, that famously described it as the biggest state-led massacre or, or the biggest state-led killing in Egypt's modern history. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that that, this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of stuff didn't elicit a violent response from the Islamist side is, is remarkable. Um, although that being said, I mean, we have to remember that the peaceful protests that we've seen on a daily basis for the last month, six months, have also been accompanied by very, you know, violent attacks on Egyptian hard targets, including military targets and police targets, um, including the most recent one, um, that was just maybe three or four days ago in the in Mansoura, in the Nile Delta. I said earlier where a car bomb went off uh, <clears throat> and killed sixteen people, including eleven police, at least eleven police officers. Uh, right police now, men. Adam, I'm sorry because we're real short on time here, uh, but it seems like we got to mention how I'm in Al Zawahiri. Here he's got to be laughing his head off in whatever basement or attic he's hiding in in Pakistan right now, uh, looking at the results of all of this over the last three years. Uh, well, yeah, in terms of if you mean uh, vindication for the hard, you know, for the hard line view that, you know, democracy and all of that stuff is all is all, you know, is all for, uh, you know, is a uh, is a loaded game or whatever. Uh, then, yeah, in terms of vindication for for, you know, against uh, against uh, democracy, then I, I, I suppose that is the case. But yeah, I mean, uh, that's that everything that, that they wanted except power for themselves. Possibly, possibly that is true, but I, it, it, it has to be stressed though that the pro Morsi camp until now is insisting on peaceful means of protest, and they continue to say we will meet our objectives here. We can meet our objectives. We can overturn. We can reverse the coup using entirely uh, peaceful uh, methods of protest. So it's not over yet. You yeah. know, we'll, well see that's a good point. Which way it goes? Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, listen. Thank you very much for your time. It's uh, always great to talk to you, Adam. Hey, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I hope to talk to you again soon. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, that is Adam Morrow from Interpress Service, IPSnews.net, reporting from Cairo, Egypt. I'm Scott Horton. This has been Anti-War Radio. Thanks very much for listening. I'm here every Sunday morning from 8.30 to 9 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. You can find my full interview archive, more than 3,000 of them now going back to 2003, at scotthorton.org. See you next week.